Our next guest twice served as a pilot with the world famous Blue Angels and was deployed to combat three, to combat three separate times, including to Iraq and Afghanistan. The retired Navy commander and Naval Academy graduate flew in the front seat as a pilot in the film Top Gun Maverick, including the scenes in which Tom Cruise blisters through a twisted canyon at lightning speeds close to rocky cliffs. In 2009, he earned a master's in systems analysis from the Naval Postgraduate School. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Commander Frank Weiser, United States Navy retired. Can you all hear me okay? So uh, it's bright up here, but a quick show of hands. Who in here has seen the Blue Angels perform? Awesome. And then who by chance happened to see a movie last summer at the uh, theaters when we got back to go into the movies after COVID? Anybody see Top Gun Maverick? All right, so I appreciate the introduction. I would like to take the opportunity today to take you inside the cockpit of the Blue Angels and behind the scenes of Top Gun Maverick and share some of the same lessons that I've learned in the military that being were cut from the same cloth, you've learned as well. So let's start with this. So my question for you, is that real or fake? I'm hearing mostly real. The answer is both. And it can be both because when you see this picture, that is Tom Cruise in a Navy F-18. He's in the back seat of an airplane I'm piloting. But it's fake because it's not an F-14. And in the movie, it appears to be an F-14. And at the same time, we weren't in an actual dogfight with a fifth gen fighter from the country that we like to call Chiran. And as you look at that picture, the reason it matters is because this is one of the very few movies where the actual US military participated. And so the, the individuals flying these airplanes are not actors from Hollywood. They are Navy and Marine Corps pilots, men, women, young, old, the whole shebang. And so that's what makes this movie exceptional is what you see on the big screen is real. It was in fact filmed because Paramount's perception was the actors can act. They're good at, at doing that. What they cannot do is act like they're in a fighter but they can act while in a fighter. And so we did that. They filmed 800 hours in our, in our Navy airplanes to make that movie come to life. So I'd like to share behind the scenes with the movie, but first, what I wanna share with you is why I was involved. And for me, it started with the Blue Angels. I did two separate tours as a solo pilot and ultimately flew with 11 of the Blue Angel teams. And so I'll give you a little background on the Blue Angels, even if you have seen them before. We take our squadron all around the country and we fly for hundreds of thousands of people. When we go to these shows, it's an opportunity for us to meet young men and women and to share with them not what we do on the Blue Angels. We don't talk about flying loops to music. We talk about why we joined the military, what our call was to serve, because flying that air show gives us the credibility to do so. But we also like to share with our veterans. We give back to the men and women that put us in these airplanes, that put us in those seats to do that job. And finally, we get an opportunity to speak all over the various cities we're in. And we talk to civic groups, we talk to schools, and one of the things I do when I have this opportunity to meet with the young men and women is I share with them why I joined the military. And I'll use an example of flying. And so I'll give them this case where if you've ever been in an airplane before, you recognize that there's this old joke. You're supposed to have the same number of takeoffs as you have landings in your logbook. That's critical. So when you take off, it's relatively easy for anyone who's done that before. The, the bigger challenge is landing. So once you're already in the sky, how do you land? Well, the, the scenario you see here is the perfect case to land an airplane. Nice, long, concrete runway, beautiful weather. Almost anybody could do it, right? If you make it dark, it's a little bit harder, just like driving at night. You lose some of the visual cues, you lose your ability to judge your speed, your descent rate, that sort of thing. But if I take it one step harder, we go to an aircraft carrier at sea, and this is more challenging even though it's daytime, because your runway is moving. It's moving away from you, 
in the distance category. It's moving left and right, and it's moving up and down. So this is an F-18 coming aboard an aircraft carrier at 165 miles per hour. And the airplane stops in 200 feet. So the first time you do it, you're told, the minute you land, you're going to think you've crashed. You haven't. You've had a successful and safe carrier landing. It's just the first time you've ever been in anything so violent. So that's what it looks like daytime. What I would tell you, in my personal experience, is the most difficult aspect of all aviation is doing that same thing but at night. And so what you're looking at on the screen is not a blank screen. That's the aircraft carrier three miles away at night. And if you look in the bottom left corner, you'll see a tiny little light. And that's what the pilots see as they get ready to come aboard. I'm going to fast forward you to the last 15 seconds so you can see what happens at sea. So if you look in the center of the screen, you'll start to see the carrier landing area, the lights become visible. Once again, you're doing 165 miles per hour. The carrier's moving left and right and up and down. And as you come aboard, you're going from 165 down to zero in just two seconds. What you see there is exactly what you see as you're coming aboard that air aircraft carrier. And the challenge is, there's no ambient lighting. There are no cities nearby. As you can see, there's no sun, moon. The clouds usually obscure that off to the North Arabian Sea. And so it's really hard to tell whether you're up or down, which direction you're going. And so you rely on your instruments. But what's most important about this, and when speaking to a group of veterans, this will ring true, I'm sure, is that it has nothing to do with the pilot in this case. The pilot is flying the airplane. I get that. But there's 6,000 people on that aircraft carrier making this whole thing work. It takes the controllers that bring you aboard. It takes the men and women on the, at, on the bridge to drive that ship. It takes the landing signal officers. It's a massive team effort. So when I go and fly Blue Angel Air shows, when we land and we had this opportunity to talk to this, these young men and women about why we chose to serve, I explain this like a football team. We're not six pilots. We're 130 Blue Angels that go around the country to perform and share our love for service. But every single member of that team is absolutely critical. I was at an air show in Wisconsin, and a, a lady walked up to me, and she said, I'm so excited the Blue Angels are in town. How many of you are there? I said, well, we're 130, but we usually bring about 50 to 60 to every air show. And she said, well, how many real Blue Angels are there? I said, well, we're 130 real Blue Angels, but we only bring 50 to 60 real Blue Angels to the show. And she said, how many pilots? And I said, see, you've misunderstood. It has nothing to do with the pilots. If our youngest enlisted maintainer doesn't do his or her job that day, our team doesn't fly the air show. And so it truly is a team where every member is equally valuable, just like on the aircraft carrier. So when you see that happen, my story for these people at all these show sites is not the fact that we just did a bunch of loops to music in a beautiful city. We'll land, I'll get the chance to talk, and I'll say, at this exact moment, it's perfect weather wherever we are, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, San Francisco, California. But at this exact second, my brothers and sisters are flying off an aircraft carrier into harm's way at night. And that's the really cool story. That's the story I'm here to share. It's not what we're doing with these blue and gold airplanes. It's what our men and women of the armed services are doing day in and day out overseas to protect our interests at home, right? And that's the really cool part about why we do what we do. So there are a couple key aspects of my military service I want to share with you. I know it will resonate. You will feel the same way about these particular things. The first is focus. For those who have deployed, especially overseas and or in combat, you recognize what it means to focus. There are times in your life, there are times during those activities that you're thinking about nothing other than the task at hand. So for me in the airplane, focus looks like this. This is flying as a Blue Angel solo pilot. You'll hear the engine spooling, and then you'll hear me run them up to full power. I'll look over my engine instruments, make sure my instruments are good, and then I'll look at my wingman who's next to me. I'll pass the thumbs up. That indicates that I like his configuration. His flaps are correct, his power settings are correct, his nozzles are programmed. And then we'll advance throttles to full afterburner, 32,000 pounds of thrust. What you'll notice as the aircraft accelerates is that I'm not looking forward. Typically when you take off, you're only looking forward, but I'm looking mostly left because I'm modulating my throttles to fly in formation on the ground before we even take off. But as I look straight ahead right here, what you're going to notice is the aircraft is already flying. The gears come up and the flaps are up, so the aircraft's accelerating very rapidly. We're at 250 knots by the middle of the field, 300 knots at the end of the runway, and at 350, both hands on the stick, seven times the force of gravity into the vertical. 
and that's the takeoff maneuver. And you see the diamond smoke overhead if you've seen this air show with the Blue Angel diamond and the solos. Now, what you might not know if you just came to watch an air show is the modifications we do to our airplanes. Clearly, they're blue and gold, not gray like a typical Hornet is. We're putting out this smoke, which normal airplanes don't want to do. An F-18 doesn't want to be spotted, but Blue Angels do want to be seen. The other thing we do is we add a spring, and the spring is very much like the 1980s with Arnold Schwarzenegger trying to expand his chest. But this spring comes out of the, the floorboards of our airplane, and it attaches mechanically to our stick. And what that means is you're doing a 40-pound curl with your right hand just to maintain level flight. If you want to climb, if you want to turn, you end up doing a 50 or 60-pound curl. And that's not terribly hard for just a few minutes. But after 45 minutes or an hour, it's quite physically taxing. And as it relates to that specific maneuver that you just saw, the challenge for us when it comes to focus is that if you relax that stick for less than half an ounce, for a, mil a millisecond, literally an eighth of a second, you've crashed immediately because you're so low. And so that's that level of focus, the same focus that you can remember when you were deployed overseas. That same focus exists in every aspect of the military today. Now the next aspect is perspective. So you just saw my perspective flying the airplane. But if you were in the crowd that day, this is what you would have seen. Perspective is absolutely critical in the Blue Angels. I'll explain that more in a second. But the reason I bring it up is because my wife and I call it the gift of perspective. And I, what that means to us is 25 years in the military and appreciating a very different perspective than what our civilian counterparts, our civilian friends and family knew. We learned it in college, we learned it when we were deployed, we learned it as a family when, when I was gone. This perspective allows you to tackle all the challenges in your life in a different manner, in an easier manner, because you appreciate the perspective. So in this case, the perspective of a young airman thousands of feet underground with his finger on a button that could start World War III is a very unique perspective, one most people don't know. Or perhaps that perspective is in a faraway land, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the only people you can count on and depend on are the ones by your side in that moment. That's a very unique perspective. Or you could be so far away from civilization that you can only rely on the equipment the government's provided you and your brothers and sisters who are deployed with you. This is this perspective that really matters, one that is, we learn in the military, one that we take with us into our future lives and the, ch the additional chapters. The perspective for me in the airplane is this. I'm five miles away from the show center. I'm at 5,000 feet. And as I descend, I accelerate from 250 to 400 knots. What you're gonna notice is my head looks to the right because I'm looking for checkpoints. And as I descend, the center of our air show site, which happens to be NAS Pensacola, is straight ahead. So I'm looking for a dock at three miles. And then at two miles, that's the bridge going on to NAS Pensacola for anyone who's been there. I have a stop sign right at that first entrance. That's my two mile checkpoint. And I'm adjusting my speed constantly from 401 knots to 398 to make sure we cross exactly over center point. But as you see, as I approach my wingman who's coming with 1,000 miles per hour of closure, I'll start to look left to try to find him. And then we're also challenged by the smoke as we come in for the first maneuver, the knife edge pass. Do you guys see him go by? A thousand miles of closure. It happens almost instantly. I'm going to slow down 120th speed here. Just approaching center point, I pull back on the stick and I push it forward. That puts the aircraft into a ballistic flight regime. We roll up on our wings so that the aircraft don't hit at center point, And you'll see my wingman go by. So it happens really, really fast. But what you might have noticed there is that my aircraft is slightly stepped up. I'm a little bit higher than he was. And the reason is the crowd is 1,200 feet away looking at our aircraft. The perspective we're looking for is this. If we do our job just right, the crowd sees that. And that's what's unique about the Blue Angels is I could come back to our debrief and say, I flew it exactly right. Or that particular maneuver, I was really satisfied with how I did it. But if the crowd saw it differently, then I failed. Because it's not about my perspective, it's the crowd's perspective. We're flying for the crowd. That's what matters. So if I carry on this maneuver, we'll finish that knife edge pass. I'll accelerate. We go away to 10 miles apart from one another again. We do a bunch of loops and rolls because it's the Blue Angels, and that's what we do. We turn in. We come back to center point one more time for the same maneuver, except this time we do it upside down. 
Now in this case, instead of positive G, you have negative Gs. You, the blood is rushing to your head. And as we cross, we push up to negative three Gs. So you're forcing yourself to red out. All the blood is rushing into your eyes. So the world starts to get red and start instead of gray. But one of the trickiest things we do on the Blue Angels is what you're seeing right here. And it's not the maneuvers the crowd sees. It's how we rejoin to get ready for the next maneuver so we can keep the air show very tight. And so we're in a 7G turn behind the crowd. We rendezvous quickly. And as we get set up here, you're going to notice that we're in the carrier landing configuration. And the reason you know that is because you're going to see my wingman's gear down as if he's landing and the tail hook down as if he's landing on the aircraft carrier. And we're doing this to showcase the incredible capabilities of the F-18. The fact that this airplane, when it's least maneuverable because it's landing, is also still highly maneuverable. And so because it's the Blue Angels, nothing is quite normal, so someone's always inverted. We fly a very awkward position here to give a very specific perspective to the crowd. So if you want to see the perspective of the crowd now that you've seen mine, the crowd sees this. My last job in the Navy was teaching our pilots how to fly a new airplane. I was responsible for moving us from the legacy F-18 to the Super Hornet, which is the airplane they fly now and that we use for Top Gun Maverick. And as I'm teaching them, I would fly with them to try to show them the new checkpoints, what had changed. And so my perspective when teaching them was this. That perspective, that angle down from the lead to the wingman gives the crowd the perspective that you just saw. The final item I want to talk about is trust. And this is one I'm sure that rings true with everyone in this room. Clearly, we trust people on a daily basis. But trust in the military is something quite different. I like to call it high trust. And what I mean by that is when you trust someone, not just in general, but with your life, and they in turn trust you with their life. And not just one time, not a singular effort, but day in, day out, over and over and over again. And to experience that trust, you have to be vulnerable enough to trust someone and also honest enough that they're in turn, they give you their trust. And so that level of trust exists throughout all the different services. One example is right here for those who served in the Air Force. This one I love because clearly anytime you get on an airplane, whether it's Delta or US Air Force, the people in the airplane are trusting the pilots. They're trusting them to keep them safe. But in this example, the pilots have a great deal of trust in their loadmaster because that airplane might have tanks, it might have 10,000 pound cargo boxes, any number of things loaded that if they're not properly loaded, if they're not properly secured on takeoff, everyone dies. So that high trust exists on takeoff right here. It also exists here. This is a great one because you're watching a Coast Guard vessel at sea with a captain of a ship, a conning officer, maintaining course and speed, a landing signals officer directing the airplane down, but also the pilots of this helicopter and the crew members who are trusting them to do their job, but also to land safely on that ship. And so the amount of high trust that exists in there is supreme. If I took you inside my airplane one more time, you'd see this. This is another opposing pass, except this time we don't roll up on our wings. We cross wingtip to wingtip. You're going to see how fast this happens. And if I rewind it one more time, because we're level, my wingtip extends almost 25 feet from my head, as does my wingman. So our wingtips are literally crossing single digit feet from one another. So that level of trust exists in us flying our brief, that I'm exactly on the line I promise, that my wingman is as well, and that we hold the right speed, the right position keeping, so that we cross literally feet from one another. After we have that cross, we do a split S, we come back again and we do it one more time. And following this cross, I'm gonna speed us up because we're going behind the crowd to rendezvous. And what you're gonna see is all six Blue Angel aircraft all together. And in the top left of my screen, you see Blue Angel 2. And if I'm doing my job just right, you don't see Blue Angel number 1, because I should be covering number 1's helmet with number 2's helmet. That's a balanced formation. But we're coming in here to land, once again, NAS Pensacola. And so this maneuver is in a descending left-hand accelerating turn. So we're going from about 1,000 feet down to 200 feet as we prepare for a pitch-up break, which is our final maneuver to land. And you're going to see the smokestacks and the trees but as you watch this video, there's one particular thing I want you to notice. So every aircraft in numbered order does a seven to eight G turn downwind. 
Now, we typically don't fly with cameras inside our airplane for the obvious risk of them coming undone and bouncing around. In a few unique cases, Boeing, who makes our airplane, will come to us and install their own cameras so that they can get this footage for their own purposes. And so this was taken a few years ago. I watched it after the flight, and it was remarkable to me one particular aspect, which I didn't appreciate until I saw a video from inside my own cockpit. And that was the fact that throughout that entire maneuver, never once did I look straight ahead. And when you're taught to land an airplane, the only place you look is straight ahead. And so despite all of your Spidey senses saying, I feel buildings, I feel trees, I know birds are going by, I want to look ahead to see where the dangers are, where the obstructions are, not a single time do I look forward. And I'm not the only one. There are five other aircraft in this formation. Four of them are wingmen, and they're all looking at the flight leader. So that flight leader is now entrusted by five other airplanes and five other pilots to put that aircraft at the exact right position, altitude, and airspeed to set us up for a safe landing. And so that's this level of high trust. That same maneuver uh, happens with the Thunderbirds. And if you've heard about the, the uh, mishap at Creech Air Force Base, it was a remarkable aviation mishap where four airplanes all in tight formation are doing a loop and they all fly into the ground at the same second because the three wingmen are trusting the flight lead to finish out that loop carefully. And that level of trust exists. It exists in the formation you just saw. It exists all around us. But because you've had the opportunity to experience that trust, especially while deployed, you recognize it when you see it. And so all of these different aspects came together in the summer of 2018, because that's when they started filming Top Gun Maverick. The reason I was involved was specifically because of the Blue Angels. They were trying to use Top Gun instructors to fly the majority of that movie. Moreover, something that you guys will all appreciate is the fact that we were deliberately flying the most junior pilots we could in the US Navy. And we were doing it as a very direct message to countries like China and Russia. We wanted them to watch this movie on the big screen. We wanted them to see it and see that it was real and know that it wasn't our most experienced aviators doing it. It was our youngest and most junior pilots who were flying some of the most extreme scenes that have ever made it to the big screen. And so they filmed that movie, and a few of the particular scenes where the aircraft was either inverted or really, really low to the ground, they came to the Blue Angels because we do that regularly. To the sense that we can mitigate the risk, that's what we do. So I was asked to be a part of it, and as we jump into it, I'll show you one of the scenes from the movie, and I promise there are no spoilers in this movie if you haven't seen it yet. So the question again is, is that real or is it fake? In this particular case, once again, it's both. And the reason is because they filmed that. There were truly actors on that set. That's at Point Loma in, in San Diego. There were extras, Navy enlisted personnel that were out there. And an airplane did fly overhead, except it was just me. And I did it over and over and over again until they had the shot they wanted. Some of the times I popped up as a missing man formation would, sometimes I went straight ahead. But I show you that scene because the amount of trust involved for me was intense. And I say that because Point Loma is a little bit of a chocolate drop. It's a 500 foot mountain right off the coast. But I was ingressing at sunset, so the sun is setting behind me. I'm traveling east, and all I could see ahead of me was dark. And so I have controllers on the ground saying, come left, come right, up or down. And each time I wouldn't know where I was in terms of the trees and the, and the mountain until I was already overhead. So you can see this side shot. There's very little clearance over those trees. So there's a great deal of trust in these individuals that are controlling the aircraft. Another scene. This is one of my very favorite scenes. And I won't even ask you, I'll tell you once again that it's both, and here's why. We actually filmed that scene just like you saw it. The only thing that wasn't real is we didn't fly that Mach 10 spaceship. We flew it in a Blue Angel F-18. And so to set that scene up, I took a Blue Angel aircraft out to China Lake, if you've ever been there. That's Ridgecrest, California, near the Death Valley. And so the camera crew set up down there where that zoomed in. You can tell there's not much to see down there but we were looking for a way to get the desired effect on the set. So they wanted this admiral who was out there on the ramp to shut down the project to get dusted by Tom Cruise taking off. So we tried a different technique to see what would bring the most dramatic effect to the camera. So we tried low and fast. So that's pretty cool, right? It leads to great pictures, 
but it didn't do the damage we wanted to the set. So we tried something a little bit different. I tried flying higher and then directing the energy of the throttles and the nozzles down to the ground. That looked like this. We tried a couple different variations. There was a light pole in the way that I'll tell you when you're flying that low, it very much felt like I was gonna hit it. So the F-18 has a cool ability to get rid of light poles. So if you look in the, uh, the left side there, by the way, it's not destruction of government. Property. So we did all that with this in mind. And what you're seeing there, the roof being ripped off the building, it was a one shot take because it destroyed the set to such a degree that we only had, the, had one opportunity. And the roof did in fact come off the building. And if you look closely at that picture, the only reason it did end up on top of the entire crew was because a bunch of conduit was running through each of the walls into the roof and then back down the other side. And that kept it from ending up somewhere far, far away. What's unique about this is the fact that the director, when he saw that, almost didn't use it in the movie because he thought it looked fake. So imagine that in this day and age where so much digital enhancement is done to these movies, so much computer graphics. We did it for real, and it looked fake enough that they almost didn't use it. So if I take you all the way behind the scenes, this is the one-shot take. So you saw what showed up on the big screen just a second ago, but this is how it looked in real life the day we filmed it. The actor was Ed Harris, he's standing by the black SUV, and he stood there and took the entire brunt of 32,000 pounds of afterburner right in his face from about five feet overhead. Hundred percent real. That shot right there was taken with an IMAX camera on the wing. I'll zoom in there. They installed IMAX cameras and the ballast behind it on the same weapon station would normally put a 500,000 or 2,000 pound bomb. First time to my knowledge that we put IMAX cameras on the wings of these airplanes, but it allowed us to get the shot you just saw. This particular shot was done in outside of Fallon, Nevada in the salt flats of Bravo 20. To set it up just right, Tom Cruise and Jerry Bruckheimer were looking for a scene they call Lawrence of Arabia. And they were looking for this to sort of intro the movie. And the idea was rather than a dot in the distance turn into a man on horseback, it was a dot in the distance that turned into a cloud of dust that turned into a fighter doing 1,000 miles an hour. But to do it just right, my airplane had to be down and set at that low altitude, eight to 10 miles away. So the challenge on my end was finding them because I'm running a downwind pattern away from them. I have a rough idea of where they are based on a GPS coordinate, but as you can see in that picture, there's nothing out there. There's no roads, there's no checkpoints, there's no buildings, it's just a bleak salt flat. So I set up, I turned in, I descended, got the aircraft fast and low, directly to a spot that I thought was where they were, and this is what happened. So here's a unique part about this and the gift of perspective. I will tell you, my perspective at that moment was I was elated to have found them because I didn't think I would. The director, who's in the puffy coat and the black hat, comes on the radio and says, we really liked it. Next time, come one foot to the right. <laughs> and that's his perspective. He needed the camera lens filled up perfectly. What he didn't know, because he doesn't fly F-18s for a living, is that at that altitude, at that speed, you cannot turn the airplane. If I turned it, the wings would literally burrow through the ground. If I stepped on the rudder pedal to make it yaw, it would translate hundreds of feet instantly. So you truly can't do anything. So all I could do was say, I'm gonna keep trying and hopefully I'll do one that exactly fills up your camera lens. Because when you're flying that airplane at this speed, 
there's very, very little time to make any corrections to adjust for that. One more scene here. Hey, man, he's up. The canyon's getting tighter. Negative payback. Increase your speed. You're going too fast, man. Well, no harm in being ahead of schedule. Damn it, slow down. I can't stay on the course. Ah, oh, you're gonna hit the wall. Watch out, watch out, watch out. When you see that scene in any of the rest of the movie, if you see the actors in the plane, it's because they were in fact in the airplane. They were flying through that canyon with Navy pilots in the front seat, and they're in the back seat. But when you see a shot like this, anytime you see a pilot from the back, that's, that is the actual Navy or Marine Corps pilot flying with that actor's helmet on. And I'm showing you this so you can be justifiably proud when you watch this movie again to know that it's our Navy and Marine Corps pilots flying those airplanes to make this movie happen. And I show you this because in that particular scene, Hangman and I are flying together, and the director had told me, I want you to fly through this canyon. You don't have to go too low yet. Get comfortable with it, learn the checkpoints, because for the rest of this week, you and Tom are gonna do this canyon over and over again. And what I really especially liked about Glenn, who plays the character of Hangman, is that he's an incredibly, genuinely nice guy. And he's also really, really tough. And we come out of that canyon, and it's hard work, even if you've done this for your whole career, like it was in my case but we come out of this canyon, two minutes of just high octane flying, and Glenn starts throwing up, and he throws up violently. And the other actor was in a different airplane, came out behind us, and he finishes throwing up, so anyone who's ever been airsick or seasick knows how miserable that experience is. He bags it up and he says, let's go. And we did it again. And we finished that another two minute round, and he threw up again. And he said, I'm done, let's go. And we did it six to eight times, that same flight, and every time he threw up and every time he said, let's do it. And that takes guts, and it's hard. And we, because he was willing to do it, we got these scenes from this, from this shot. So to set that up right for the rest of the week, my direction was to fly as low as I possibly can safely, but with Tom in my back seat. So I take what amounts to a variety of precise coordinates. These are the coordinates for that route you just saw. And I type them into Google Earth, because this is the friend of all the Navy pilots. And so I'm using satellite study here. The yellow pin is the entry, but I'll show you where NAS Fallon is. This is the airport we took out, off from. It's about an hour and a half east of Reno. But this route is about 80 miles east-southeast from the base. And so I use this satellite study to prepare for this flight. So I'll zoom in on the first point. I'll get it to an eye height that I intend to enter at and I'll know that my very next turn point is five miles away, it's gonna take me this many seconds, and at that point, it's gonna take six Gs to make that 30 degree check turn, and then it's gonna be only three and a half seconds to the next turn, and then my airplane can't hack that turn, so I've gotta pop up, I have to climb over the mountain range, and then descend down, and when I'm descending down, I have to figure out the right flight path angle for the descent, the right trajectory, the right time to pull back up and level off so I don't hit the mountain walls. And so I'm doing this satellite study, and the reason it, it's, incredibly critical at this point is because when you fly Navy airplanes, the lowest you're allowed to fly in a fighter is 500 feet. If you're proficient and experienced, after a few flights in the same week, you can go down to 200 feet. But at 200 feet altitude, you're allowed a mission cross check time of one second. What that means is you're only allowed to look inside to change the radio channel, update your weapon system, your navigational system for one second. Otherwise, your eyes are out. They're on the horizon. They're searching for other aircraft, for birds, for obstructions, because that's how critical the threat of the low terrain is. So to put an airplane at 10 or 20 feet requires a good bit of study. And so I went through that, and this is the scene we filmed. So once again, real or fake? A hundred percent real. Everything you see in that scene was filmed with their in-cockpit and out-cockpit IMAX cameras. When you see this shot, there are two things I want you to know. One, that's a Navy or Marine Corps pilot, like I mentioned, and in this particular case, it's me because I was flying this particular scene with Tom. However, the thing you might notice is for those of us who've been in the military, in my 25 years, never once did my hair get that long. Paramount, though, goes to great lengths to make sure everything we do is realistic. 
And so it reminds me of this quote that you might be familiar with. It doesn't, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. Because I will tell you, Navy and Marine Corps pilots are not getting credit for Top Gun Maverick. The actors for sure are. But to make sure they did it just right, they glued Tom's hairline to the back of my head. <laughs> so let me close with this slide. And I use this slide specifically because that low altitude pass that I shared with you earlier, to set that up, there was a great deal of risk because the, the aircraft is so low. The risk was so high that the three-star admiral in charge of all of aviation, our air boss that owns every single airplane in the Navy, was calling me before and after every flight to debrief and brief. That's his level of risk. With all the things going on in his world, he was most concerned that we were putting an airplane down at 10 feet for Top Gun Maverick. What was ironic to me is after I landed after that filming session, I'm curious to hear if we got the shot right and what I found out was, yes, they definitely got the shot they wanted, but then we did that same pass over and over and over again so everyone on the Paramount crew could take selfies. <laughs> so I'll wrap up with that, but what I would like to say, what I hope resonates with this group is I have had the privilege because of this movie, because of the Blue Angels, to speak to a variety of businesses, aero clubs, schools, churches, you name it. But the group that I most enjoy speaking to are veterans because we all are cut from the same cloth and we all can appreciate what went into this. We all recognize that in this particular movie, it wasn't made possible because of great actors. It was made possible by a great military that allowed itself and put the expertise of the men and women involved to go forth. So as I shared when I was speaking to the Coast Guard Academy just a few weeks ago, I said, in my mind as someone who has served and doesn't get the opportunity to serve again, the choice to serve, the, the opportunity to serve it's not required, it's not an obligation, it's a privilege. And I do believe everyone in this room understands that. And I believe you join me in understanding that we have all been privileged to serve, and what we gain from it is probably more than we put into it. But I would like to thank you for your service, tell you that I'm grateful for being here, and wish you all the very best. Thank you. From one commander to the other, I'd like you to sign you up for the American Legion. So <laughs> I trust that you'll fill that application out. Yes, sir. I'm going to give you a, a, a diamond lapel pin. But you got to remember, once you get in the American Legion, there's no rank among us. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So there's a gentleman back here to pick that up.